Father, we seek you. Father, we seek to know you more than ever before. We seek to dwell in your presence, God.
our voices let it rain let it rain open the floodgates of heaven let it rain let it rain open the floodgates of heaven Raise your hands. Come on. Let's lift our hands to the Lord. He's here right now. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place this morning. We raise our hands to you because you are our Abba Father. And Father, we pray right now that you pour down your blessings upon our church. Bring healing to the lives that need healing this morning, Father. And may your anointing just fill this place. Let your Shekinah glory just indwell up our church right now. That healing will begin in this church. Restoration will begin in this church. Let your anointing and your outpouring of your Holy Spirit be evident in our lives, Father, this morning. Father God, I pray that those that are watching by the internet, Father God, that you would reach out right now and touch them, Lord. Let their joy be unspeakable and full of glory, Father God, for you said that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And Father, before we do anything else, Father God, we cry out to you. We bow before you, God. And thank you, Lord, for being here with us this morning. In the name of the Father, the Son, and your Holy Spirit, and the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Reunion. I'm Pastor Dom, and um, we just want to welcome you this morning. But before we go and greet um, each other, or before I send you to um, take up the offering, I just want you to post to turn around, greet each other in the name of the Lord. You're going to see some people that you may have not seen for a while, but greet them. Or may, may this, is, this is your first time we want to welcome you to Reunion Hawaii this morning. God bless you.
again. While you folks are still greeting each other or greeting each other in the name of the Lord, I just want to welcome you guys again back to Reunion, our Pastor Dom. Um, just a couple of announcements before I turn it over to Pastor Gary, who will bring, bring us the message this morning. Um, just on March 10th at 10 o'clock here, don't forget that Sean Welcome will be with us. Okay, so if you folks haven't missed, um, sorry, there's no video today, so <laughs> you got to deal with me. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, anyway, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a po poetry <laughs> slam, not this morning. Okay, but anyway, um, he will be coming here, so please um, tell your friends, um, let them know if, if, if there are any, any ones who are into poetry, doing poetry slam and stuff, this is one guy you don't want to miss, Okay. You want to bring them here at 10 o'clock at uh, March 10th. Also, um, a milestone stone day, a milestone day, March 17th. Uh, we have, we will dedicate young Elliot Brown to receive the Lord, uh, receive new members into the church. Um, we're also going to ordain our brother Josue Gonzalez um, on that day as well. So a lot of things are going on. At, also, there's the water baptism. Um, on March 17th, and it will be, is it going to be at Ka uh, Kailua? It's going to be at Kailua Beach where we normally have it. So I, I, I just want to encourage you folks, you know, if you guys can get out there, you guys are like, we're so blessed to be here in Hawaii, you know, and to be baptized, water baptized, one of the most pristine beaches in the world, you know, the top 10. We usually rate top 10 in whatever beaches. But um, it's just a, it's not just the beauty of the beach or Hawaii. It's the beauty of seeing someone publicly saying that I truly believe in Christ and I'm making a commitment today in front of everybody, you know. And um, I just want to encourage you folks there that, you know, it's the best thing when, when, when someone does something and makes a commitment and your family is there. You know, like a big graduation, and I've seen, I've been to graduation where the guy graduates and the parents can't make because they're working or they're, you know, and stuff, and it's the, like the saddest feeling. So I just want to encourage you folks that, you know, those that are making that commitment that day, that they're really taking a step of faith, and, and especially those that have come from a um, life situation where maybe they had a, they were raised in a different religion, and they have to take a stand, a stand of faith that, you know, their whole family will turn against them. And so that's, that's very encouraging to know that when they come out of the water, come in a brand new creature, committed to the Lord, that our family, your, this ohana is there to support them. So if you can make it, make it out um, that day. Okay, March 17th. Saying that, um, if you are brand new to the Lord, you gave your heart to the Lord, and, you know, you wanted to know, man, what am I getting myself into? We have a first steps course, um, and then also, if you're thinking about becoming a member, it's not too late. You can still sign up and become a member. Um, you can also attend our membership class, and then also um, have water baptism, and the we just want to encourage you folks, the first step class will start March 3rd, and it's going to be at Windward Worship Center, and that's going to be um, taught by Christian Brown, um, our pastor Christian Brown, and also March 10th for membership class. You know, a lot of times people is like, oh, I don't know about this organization. Isn't that the weird one? Or isn't that, you know, you all hear this, this 
these little things about what what is the church of God? What is church of God of prophecy? What's the difference between assemblies of God or this God or whatever? Uh, if you're curious or you want to find out, you know, more about the history of our of our denomination, I just encourage you folks to come out. Come out at 2 p.m. March 10. Come out to the class so you can get the, you know, so you can get your answers, your questions answered. You know, and I just want to encourage you folks. It's going to be maybe an hour, hour and a half long, maybe even shorter. Depends on if anybody has a lot of questions. Uh, but I just want to encourage you folks to come out that day. If you are thinking about doing that on the back um, table, on, on this side, the red table, there is a sign-up sheet. We just encourage you folks to sign up so that we know how many, if we're making flyers or making pamphlets for you to take home, that we know how much that we can print out and make sure that you're on our roster, okay? So please do that for us. Um, one more thing. Um, pastors, there is a meeting this coming Tuesday night. And it's going to be at 7.30 at Windward Worship Center in Kaneohe. Okay? So that's all I have for you. So, Pastor Gary. I want to uh, just sort of reinforce what he just said about the sign-up sheet at the back. If you um, are still contemplating and unsure, I want to encourage you to go sit through the Sit through the class and and hear it out and listen and make your decision. And then on the 17th, we'll be doing all this stuff, new members and baptism and baby dedications and ordination. It's going to be a huge day for you to invite your friends. And I want to thank those of you who have taken part in this one day's pay uh, situation. We had some of those, I think, still back at the back, these little cards. And a bunch of you have um, pledged one day what you make in one day, one day's pay, and you have, some of you have already turned that in, in fact. Uh, I get a report every Sunday or Monday. They tell me that we've got so much turned in already, and so uh, if you have pledged to do that, you have until June 30th to fulfill that, that honor, that commitment that you've made, and uh, Tuesday night at our pastor's meeting, we'll be talking about where that money's going to go, and um, yeah, so I appreciate that very, very much. Last week, we said goodbye to Anthony and Allie Sickler um, as they left us to move to Boston. And I think I mentioned how hard it is to live in Hawaii with a transient military population. We meet folks and we fall in love with them. And then they say, oh, I'm getting transferred. I've got orders. I'm going to be moving. And we go, oh, no, we love these folks. We don't want to tell anybody goodbye, but we have to say aloha and watch them fly off to their new assignments sometimes. And I was just thinking this week after saying goodbye to them and seeing them post pictures on the airplane and, you know, arriving in Chicago and then arriving in Boston and everything, I was thinking back over how many people over the years have come through our churches here who have been just here for a short time, and, and there's just a list of names, and, and going way back into the early 80s for me, uh, Edna Waden and, and people like that that we're still in touch with and, and, and still have contact with. There was one couple who met each other at our church, and I was honored to perform their wedding. And they've been gone since 2006. Um, but Ryan and Julie Hobson still stay in touch with us. Um, I get a call from Ryan on a pretty regular basis and uh, tells me, you know, what's going on in their life, catches me up on, on jobs and moves and kids and, you know, all the stuff that's happening in their lives. And he called me yesterday just to kind of bring me up to speed on current events because Ryan has... Um, kind of acknowledged me as one of his mentors, and he said something really powerful. He said something very encouraging. I was talking to him about that very thing, about the transient nature and having to say goodbye all the time and, and how it just rips your heart out. And he told me, don't ever discount the time and the love invested in those short-term transient relationships. Don't ever discount that. And then he went on to talk about what a deep lifetime connection was made during their time here with us. 
and he encouraged me, he encouraged us, really, to continue to love those people who are here just for a short time because we're making a huge impact and a huge difference in their lives. And it's true that we still have people who have been gone from here six years, eight years, ten years, twelve years, who still feel connected to this church, who are probably watching this service right now, streaming on the Internet, and, and they're probably uh, still connected to us. And, and some of them, even though they moved away years and years and years ago, they go on our website and they still tithe to this local church. There have been times where we would have gone under if it had not been for those folks who were long-distance tithers who, who don't even live here anymore. Ryan Hobson, in every call, in every email, in every Facebook message, I would describe him as an encourager. And there's some of you in this room who are encouragers. You can pretty well divide the world into two groups of people. There are encouragers and critics. Don't yell any names out, okay? It really wouldn't be good. Do not yell any names out. But you know that. You know you know some of each kind of people, encouragers and critics. There are both kinds of people where you work, on your job, in your military unit, in your school. There are both kinds of people, encouragers and critics. There, in your home, there's probably encouragers and critics. Where you live, probably at the table you're sitting at right now, there are encouragers and critics. Again, don't yell any names out and don't point. But you know what I'm saying. There are probably, it's just you can divide the world and you know those people, you see them coming. Encouragers and critics. It's really difficult to escape the, the critics, the discouragers, because there are so many of them. There's way more of them than there are the encouragers. And that's why the encouragers stand out so much. If you're in a, a person who is always uplifting others and building them up and encouraging them and patting them on the back and telling them, attaboy, you can do it, then, then you, you make a huge impression because you stand out from the crowd of all the critics. All, all the critics. Here, here's what the critics sound like. That'll never work. Nah, never work. You're not qualified to do that. Who told you you were qualified to, to do that? That's a stupid idea. Who came up with that? That's stupid. I love this one. We've never done it that way before. That's the words that are carved on the tombstone of a dead church, by the way. We've never done it that way before. Why did you do that? You, you, are those words echoing in some of you and reverberating a little bit because you hear them all the time? That's because the world is full of critics and discouragers. Here's, here's my favorite. What they need to do over there at that church is this. Not we, not what we need to do. What they need to do. Somehow they're, they're removed from the situation and it's, it's some anonymous them that needs to do it. Somewhere in your past, there have been critics and discouragers who slowed you down, and there have been encouragers who urged you on. The world, well, and the church, to be honest with you, has way too many critics. We're kind of overstaffed in that area, but we got lots of openings for encouragers. So this morning, we're taking applications this morning for encouragers. We want you to be one of those. Um, I've printed in your bulletin. The passages of Scripture we're going to be looking at today, and you can open that to find the references, and you can take notes if you want to. Um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. But I, I really love how this reads in the message, and that's why I kind of put part of that on the front of the bulletin today. It says, let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out, not avoiding worship together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. Let's see how inventive we can be. Can you think of how many ways you can affirm someone and encourage them and uplift them rather than finding fault and criticizing? I got to tell you, easiest thing in the world to do is find fault. It's the easiest thing in the world. I, I heard an interview by a policeman the other day who said if they want to stop somebody for anything, all they have to do is follow them long enough, and they'll find some minor infraction that will give them cause to pull them over. Because 
everybody who's driving down the road does something slightly. You swerve just a little bit. Oh, that yep, swerve, that's reckless driving. Yeah. You slight, go one mile over the speed limit. You go through that yellow light just as it's changing. You do a Hollywood stop, you know, at the, at the, you know, the California roll. Yeah, you know, you know the Hollywood stop. You slow down, take a bow, keep going. Yeah, it's, you know, everybody in here has done that at some time or the other. Some of you more than others. And so it's really easy if that policeman's wanting to find fault with you, he can find something to find fault with. And people in the church, I got to tell you, the, the, the churches of America are full of critics who all know how it's supposed to be done, and they'll tell you exactly what you should be doing better. But you and I are called to be life's cheerleaders. We're called to be the encouragers. We're called to be the people that say, you can do it. boy, let's go. Great job. You can do this. We're called to see the good in people. We're called to uplift them and encourage them. And I want to talk for a few minutes about a New Testament guy named Joseph, who we'll call Barney the Preacher. Acts chapter 4, verse 36 in the Living Bible calls him that. It says, there was Joseph the one the apostles nicknamed Barney the Preacher. Now, you never, you've never heard him called that because the NIV says Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means, I love this, son of encouragement. That, that's, what a great name to have if somebody was nicknaming you. Hey, there comes the encourager right there. It's like, you know, one of those, like the Terminator, it would be the encourager. That would be a great, great nickname. Barnabas, the encourager. He was not an apostle. Get this. He was not one of the key figures in the New Testament as far as rank. Now, and you know this as well as I do. There are people who have titles and ranks, but they never live up to them. They just carry a title and a rank, but they never live up to it. And there are people who are faithful and dependable and have no title, no position, no authority, really, but you can count on them, and you can always count on them. Which one would you rather have around? I'd rather have the dependable one. Barnabas was not an apostle, but not an apostle, but he had an important ministry. He's mentioned 25 times in the book of Acts and five other times in the epistles. That's pretty major. How many people are named 30 times in the New Testament that were not like Paul or Peter or somebody? Not everybody can be as bold as Peter, and not everybody can be as a leader like Paul, but everybody in this room can be an encourager like Barnabas. You can, you can start it today. You can be an encourager. I'm going to give you three ways that Barnabas was an example in encouragement. I'll give them to you up front in case you're a note taker and you want to write them down. He was an encourager in finances, in fellowship, and in failure. Finances, fellowship, and failure. Preachers love those alliterative, you know, things that all start with the same letter. He was an encouragement in finances. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. Now, I need to preface this. There are things in the Bible that are prescriptive. They are directive. There are passages that when you read them, it's saying, this is how you need to do it. Because this is, this is I'm writing this so you'll know how to live. And there are other passages that are not prescriptive, but they are descriptive. They're describing something, but they're not necessarily saying that's what you must do. You understand the difference? This is a descriptive passage. In other words, it's not intended to suggest that all believers in all times are required to do exactly this, but it's to show us a pattern, a heart attitude, a motive that we're to apply in our own context. So listen to this passage. It's a descriptive, not a prescriptive starting in verse 32 of the fourth chapter of Acts. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. Now, you can underline that one because I think that, is a great descriptive and a great pattern for us to follow. There were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, 
this is Barnabas, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought it to the feet and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, does this passage say that everybody in here is to sell everything they own and bring it and put it at the feet of the church? No, it's not prescriptive. It's descriptive. It's telling what happened. It's describing what happened. But is the heart motive a pattern for us to follow? Absolutely. They said, as long as we have some people in need and I have things that I don't have to have to survive, hey, I'll give it up to take care of my brother and sister who's struggling and in need. Some of you have done that with exactly this, with this, with this one day's pay thing. You trusted the leaders of this church. We have not even told you where the money's going yet. But you filled this card out and dropped it in the bucket back there to the tune of about $4,000 worth of pledge, trusting that the leaders of this church have enough integrity and wisdom to put that somewhere where it will make a difference in the lives of people who are in need. That speaks well of you that you have that kind of trust, just like these people did. So here's Barnabas being an example in finances. He was an encouragement by being generous to people in need. Is that a way to encourage someone? Oh, you better believe it. Again, don't you don't have to shout out a name or anything, but this has happened to me. I have looked in my pocket to see how much cash I had. You know, like, oh, I gotta get I gotta after I gotta have money for lunch after church and maybe I gotta stop and get gas or whatever. So I look and I pull out and I say, Oh, I got I got twenty bucks. I got a twenty on me. Hmm. I better hang on to that. That's my lunch today. I put it in my pocket and then somebody walks in and God says, <coughs> Go over there and give them that twenty. And I'm going, but but Lord, that's that's my that's my lunch money. That's my pocket money. You know, that's 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 lunch. But then God says, Go give them that twenty. And you know when he says it like that, real stick you know, go give them. you go, Well yeah, okay. <laughs> the Lord told me to give you this. You know? And you put that in their palm. And sometimes you don't know it, but that person has by faith come to church running on fumes and doesn't have gas money to get to work Monday morning. But by faith, they said, I need to be in the house of the Lord today. I'm going to come to church. Gas is like, what, 430 a gallon? I don't know what it is now. So it's expensive. It costs a lot of money to operate a vehicle. And there's people who will take their last little bit of gas, their tanks below a quarter of a tank, and come to church. God honors that faithfulness. And sometimes he honors it by putting it on your heart to bless them. I just read a thing the other day. Somebody said they pulled up at the gas station. They didn't have a lot of money. And the guy in front of them came back there while they were getting ready to pump the gas and put in, you know, wet the bottom of their tank so they could get home. And the guy came up and said, no, pull up here. I've already put my card through the thing. Pull up here. I'm going to fill your car up. Just a total stranger blessed them out of the clear blue. What a blessing that is. You know, I mean, we're, we're not talking $20 now to fill somebody's car up. We're talking 60 or $80. That's a blessing if somebody does that to you. You can encourage, you can be an encourager financially by blessing someone just from your overflow, folks, if you make, get this statistic, if you make your household income is $35,000 a year, if your household income is $35,000 a year, you are in the top 5% of the wealth of the world. And 35000 is not a lot of money in Hawaii, but you're in the top 5%. And you say, well, I don't have much. I'm struggling. Yeah, I know. So is everybody else. But sometimes God will take that 20 and burn a hole in your pocket with it until you obey him and go back and bless somebody. We had a girl at church in in Alabama. I've told this story before, but it's been a while. And the Lord laid it on my heart today. Um, She had small kids, and the kids came to church, and and they were all acting fidgety and kind of cranky and out of sorts. And the Sunday school teacher asked them what was wrong and, and and came to one of the leaders of the church and said, 
those kids have not had anything to eat this morning, and they didn't have dinner last night. They just told me. And so one of the leaders pulled the mom aside and said, are you struggling? Do you? The kids are hungry. Let's go get them something to eat. And, and are you struggling? Do you, do you have food at home? And she just broke down and started crying. She said, no. No. We don't have anything. We got nothing. And so a bunch of the guys got in a huddle and said, get your wallet out. Let's go. And they just started, you know, pulling out what they had in their wallets and got a fistful of money and went over and said, go buy groceries now. You just leave church right now. Go buy groceries. Feed your babies. Folks, that's encouraging that's encouraging someone with your finances. I got to move. <laughs> Proverbs 11, verses 24 and 25 says, One man gives freely yet gains even more, and another withholds unduly but comes to poverty. A generous man will prosper. You are not going to go into the poorhouse by giving. I, I'll just promise you that. that. That's a scriptural promise. You're not, you're not going to starve to death, and you're not going to end up you know, living under a tarp on the sidewalk somewhere because you gave to somebody else. God will bless you and he will provide for you. Barnabas was an encourager in fellowship. He was an encouragement in the way of fellowship. Acts chapter 9, verses 26 and 27. This is a really important passage, by the way. You need to know this. When he, Saul came to Jerusalem. He tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing he really was a disciple. Now, let's back up. What was the history of this? Saul was a persecutor of the church. Saul was the guy that was had his mission in life was to go out and find followers of Jesus and kill them. He would go into a town where they were trying to plant a little congregation, and he would go in the temple and sniff them out and go, that's one of them right over there. Let's go, let's go have him stoned. He was trying to kill all the Christians. So now he has this conversion experience, and he becomes a follower of Jesus, and he comes and he wants to join up and hook up with the disciples. And they're going, yeah, no, uh-uh, I don't trust that guy. Last week I saw him throwing rocks at people trying to kill him. And he wants to come in here and join us now? Uh, no, I don't think so. Verse 27, but Barnabas, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. Barnabas became a sponsor mentor to Paul. We talked about this in a mentoring class. A sponsor mentor is somebody who sees potential in you and opens the door and makes a way and clears a path for you because they see potential in you. And so here he was. Paul was distrusted and there was pretty good reason to distrust him. The people who distrusted him, you would have too. I would have. I would have said, yeah, I'm not sure about him, man. We need to keep a close watch on this guy. I'm not sure we want to let him in the meeting. But Barnabas saw something that was changed and transformed in him, and he said, no, this guy, something's happened to him. I heard him preaching Jesus, and you can trust him, and you can take him in. He became a sponsor to him and introduced him into the fellowship Romans chapter 12, verse 10 says, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. What does that mean to be devoted to one another? It means, I got your back. If somebody comes to me and says, Hey, did you hear this thing that I heard? I heard this rumor about Samuel. Did you, did you hear that rumor about Samuel? So what's, what's my first reaction if I'm devoted to him in brotherly love? Number one, I don't want to hear it. And number two, I'm going to give Samuel the benefit of a doubt. Always, I'm going to think the best of him until he proves otherwise. That's what, that's what it means to have one another's back. It means, you know, that Benny guy, I heard this thing, you know, rumor, innuendo, accusation, whatever. And I say, you know what? I know Benny, and that doesn't sound like him. I'm not going to go I'm not going to go that direction. I'm certainly not going to repeat it. In fact, I don't believe it. I have to see that with my own eyes before I believe. You know what I'm saying? You understand where I'm going? 
when you're devoted to one another, you've got the other person's back, and you stand up for them, and you stand back to back with them against the enemy. Uh, here's something that, that's really, I noticed, and it's really an interesting thing. He was a sponsor mentor for, for the Apostle Paul, or Saul, Paul. In Acts 11, verses 25 and 26, and in Acts 12, verse 25, the Scripture says Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas' name is listed first. Because why? He was on the inside, and Saul was being eased into the inner, inner circle. And suddenly in Acts chapter 13, verse 42, it switches to Saul and Barnabas. The order changes in chapter 13, verse 42. What happened there? The mentor was not afraid to see the person that he was trying to encourage and trying to mentor rise to a position above his own. Didn't have any ego invested, was not afraid of that. That did not bother him, did not scare him away at all. He saw great potential in him, and he says, this guy is going to take this thing to places I could never take it. I, You know, man, put him up. Put him up front. That's what a sponsor mentor does. I used to have a poster. I can't find it anymore. I think it got destroyed. That said, there's no limit to what a man can accomplish if he doesn't care who gets the credit. And that's the problem sometimes with us not accomplishing anything is we want all the credit. But if we would just quit caring about who got the credit for it. And in fact, people who are in leadership who are effective leaders, they give credit to everybody else and they take the blame when something goes wrong. I made some notes here in the side of my notes. It says, leave your ego parked at the door. That's the way it should be in the church. You come in and say, well, I'm all that, you know. No, leave that at the door. Surround yourself with people smarter than you and better at things than you are and let them have all the credit and promote their success. That's being an encourager in fellowship. You're promoting other people and lifting them up. We've talked about this before, but it bears repeating today. The world's definition of success, it looks like this. The important people are at the top. You know, that's the way it is in government, and that's the way it is in, in corporations, in the military. The generals are at the top. The president is at the top. The CEO is at the top. And then there's some middle-level managers, and there's a bunch of peons down at the bottom, you know, the rest of us. We're at the bottom down here doing all the work, and they're getting all the money up here at the top, and we're doing all the work. Do you understand that? But the, the church's structure is exactly the opposite of that. The church's structure is this. The person who wants to be the greatest among you, let them be the servant of all. The person who's supposed to be the top leader, the person who's at the big shot, supposedly, is at the bottom pushing everybody else up, pushing them forward, pushing them to the front, lifting them up, encouraging them. That's the church's structure. That's the structure we want to we wanna emulate. Let me give you the third one. Barnabas was an encouragement in failure. Or may, maybe you want to say encouragement in spite of failure. Acts chapter 15, verses 37 and 38. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. So, so this guy, Mark, had gone on one missionary journey, but when things got tough, he bailed out. Yeah, man, this is not for me. i got to get out of here. And he went back home. And so Paul looked at him and went, dude, that guy's a, he's a washout. He's a failure. He's, no, nah, I ain't taking him. No, nah, leave him at home. You come with me, but don't bring him. He's just going to be a dead weight anchor, going to be dragging him around all the time. And here's the power of encouragement, verses 39 and 40. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Did, did you catch that? These are two leaders in the church, two respected elders, two people that are both good people. Neither one of these people was a bad person. Barnabas wasn't bad. Saul wasn't bad. But they disagreed so strongly on this procedural matter that they parted company. The message said, 
tempers flared and they ended up going their separate ways. Can you imagine that? You mean two people can be serving the Lord and not agree on everything? Well, yeah. Happens all the time. It happens all the time. Why do you think there's a denomination on every corner? It's because this group believes one minor point of doctrine different. This group says, no, that's wrong. This is what's really right. And this group says their emphasis is all wrong. And uh, they're too liturgical. They're not liturgical enough. Oh, uh, they baptize people by sprinkling them. No, they dunk them in water. Oh, uh, we use wine for communion. They use grape juice for communion. You know, all this division stuff is because people can't always agree on the details. And yet, all of them serving the Lord and loving God with all their hearts. Isn't that amazing? They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark, the guy that Saul discarded and threw away, and sailed for Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, which is why from some of those missionary journeys, then you read not, not Paul and Barnabas, but Paul and Silas. Why, do you, why did they switch teammates? Couldn't get along, couldn't agree about a guy that was a, that was a mess up. He was a washout. Everybody thrown him away. So that's that. There goes Mark's ministry career. No. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Paul wrote, get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. What happened? What happened? The encourager, Barnabas, believed in Mark and said, no, he's not a mess up. He can come with me. I'll disciple him. I'll train him. I'll mentor him. He can follow me. You don't see the good in him, but I see some greatness in him. And what happened? Saul comes around later on and says, hey, bring that Mark guy back with you. He could be really useful, you know. He's, he's pretty good. Paul was smart enough to recognize that given a second chance, Mark had proven himself and was now a valuable team member. And it was because of Barnabas, the encourager. Man, I want to be an encourager. I, I've said this publicly. I've said it privately to some of you. I, I've said it on Twitter. I've said, you know, I, I'm 62 years old. I've got a few good years left in me, but not not hundreds of years left in me. I don't have decades left to do this, and you know that. And and I've always said I don't want to be the guy who's like stumbling up here and they're saying, oh man, I wish he would just get out of here and retire. You know, I, I want to go while there's while people can still pat me on the back and say. All right, good job. But I but I'm trying to I'm trying to leave a legacy and the legacy that I want to leave is a is a cadre of on fire, plugged in, well equipped, released, empowered young pastors and leaders, evangelists and missionaries. That's what I'm trying to raise up around this church so that when I say, All right, that's it, I'm gone, I'm out of here. And I go sit down in the rocking chair back there and cheer them on. There's just, you could just pick any table in here and one of them could step up here and do what, what I'm doing right now. And that's what's happening right around us in this room. You just look around you at the young pastors and missionaries and evangelists who are being raised up in this room right now. And, and that's my role as the, as the bishop, as the overseer, is, is to release, to recognize and release. It's to say, I see greatness in you. I see potential in you. Go get them. You've got my covering. You have my, my backing. You have whatever. What do you need from me in order to go do that? I'll, make, I'll clear the path for you. And you're in a different role, but I'm going to give you a little homework assignment. You, did you look inside the bulletin and there's a little A and a B down there in a little box? You see that down there in the corner? A and a B. I'm going to give you, you don't usually get homework at church, do you? But I'm going to give you a homework ex assignment. And I'm going to encourage you to do it as quickly as possible, today if possible. A, box A, is somebody who has believed in you, given you a second chance, encouraged you, been a cheerleader for you, has tell, told you you can do it when you didn't have confidence and faith in yourself. I want you to write a name in that box. Think about it. Somebody who has... Somebody has had your back, who has lifted you up, who has been below you saying, you can do it. Son, daughter, you know, young man, young woman, grandpa, grandma, I, I believe in you and I see greatness in you and I want to see you be all that God has called you to be. Somebody, 
There, there are people in your life, and you know everybody in here has had somebody who's done that for you. You wouldn't be here today. You wouldn't be here had there not been somebody. It may be a parent, an aunt, an uncle, a pastor, a, t- a, a children's church worker, a Sunday school teacher, a uh, you know a, a high school coach. A, you know, it's, somebody has done that for you. Write that name down in there. And in the second box, B, you know somebody right now today that you feel like needs to be encouraged. They're struggling. They're discouraged. They're beat down. They have had the critics and the discouragers surround them and tell them, you can't do it. You're not qualified. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not whatever enough. And fed them the lies of the devil, and that's all it is. It's just that's the the lies of the enemy. If you know somebody that needs to be lifted up and needs to be encouraged, That's the name you write in B. Now, here's your assignment. Those two people, call, text, Facebook, email, go knock on their door, write them a note, mail them a card. Do it today if possible, this week for sure, to both of them, to both of them. To the person that encouraged you, say, I I heard a sermon at church Sunday And the pastor was talking about somebody who had been my cheerleader, had been my encourager, who had been somebody who had pushed me forward and believed in me, and that was you, and I just wanted to thank you for that. It makes a difference in their life to know that you notice it. And that other person, I had you on my heart today as the pastor was talking about someone who needs encouragement. I just felt like you've been going through it, and I want you to know that I love you. I'm praying for you. I'm encouraging you. You can make it. You can do it. Will you do both of those things, would you? And, and I'm going to ask you to stand and hold those papers up with those two names on it. We're going to pray over them right now. Could you stand with me? Father, what a great example you gave us in Barnabas. And Barney the preacher. What? What a great example you gave us of somebody who was able to see the best in, in people that everybody else was throwing away. Lord, when, when Saul was being rejected, when Mark was being rejected, Barnabas said, no, 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 I believe in them. Thank you, Lord, for giving us that example in the New Testament of, of, of a great encourager. Thank you, Lord, that, that he didn't hold on to possessions tightly, but he encouraged people in finance. And he encouraged them in, in fellowship. And he encouraged them in failure, in spite of their failures. He, he said, that's okay. I know you messed up, but, but I still believe in you. Help us to be that kind of encourager to somebody today, Lord. There are people who are just struggling. And they're just they're wrestling with all the lies of the enemy. The enemy has spoken death and discouragement and failure and, and emptiness. It just has spoken that over them so many times, so repeatedly that they're starting to believe it. And we rebuke that in the name of Jesus in, in the authority of Jesus Christ. We rebuke that right now, Lord. And we come into alignment with your plans for those people who have been beat down. We will be their encouragers today. So, Lord, for every person who's holding up that paper and they've written a name in in the A block, I ask you to help them to reach out to that person who's been a blessing to them, an encouragement to them, and send them a text message or post something on their Facebook or or however they want to communicate with them, a phone call, a, a note, a card, an email message, something, Lord. Go up and hug their neck and tell them in person, kind of better in writing. So they can go back and read it over and over. But Lord, I, I just pray that you'll give them the give them the, the 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 encouragement to go do that. And then for the other person who needs encouragement, God, put somebody on our hearts today that needs to hear these words. You can do it. I believe in you. There's so much power in those words. I believe in you. And so Lord, help us to be a Barnabas in someone's life today. That you will receive all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here today.